It was so very sad at nine o'clock to arrive as usual, and Meredith Glenn wasn't here. So I uh, learned of his death while I was in Italy, and uh, such a loss for us as a parish. Um, but he was a man of faith, and I understand Madre Karen gave a terrific uh, homily uh, at his funeral, and so we continue to commend Meredith to Almighty God. And this is a jet lag sermon, so I get away with everything, right? <laughs> So a tired and impatient traveler finally arrived to his Venice hotel and stumbled to the front desk and said impatiently in the way that Americans often speak in Europe, I sure hope you speak English. I'm exhausted and I've been flying for 16 hours. I'm hungry and I have a terrible headache. Can you just tell me what room I'm in? <laughs> Certainly, signore, the helpful clerk replied. You are in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> An American in Madrid stopped at a restaurant near the Plaza de Toros and he orders a Negroni and catches a whiff of a delicious looking dish at the next table. And he asks the waiter what the dish is and he's told that they are bull testicles. But being adventurous, the tourist tells the waiter he'd like the same thing. Oh, perdón, señor, says the macero. There is only one serving a day because there is only one bullfight a day in July. So the tourist goes back early the next day to the same restaurant and places his order and he digs zealously into his dish, but he flags the waiter's attention. This plate seems a much smaller plate than the one I saw last evening, says the tourist. Si, sí, senor, says the waiter. Sometimes the bull wins. <laughs> Tells you I need forgiveness, jet lag covers a multitude of sins. So during my family travels, I missed Canada Day and Los Locos and the closing of Atencion and the 4th of July, and I missed all of you. And I hope you miss me too, though after those jokes, you're probably pining for the supply clergy. <laughs> The prophet Zechariah points the way for us today, declaring us to be prisoners of hope. Zechariah is a prophet laboring to encourage the people during the restoration of Jerusalem. Artaxerxes I permitted the first return of Jews to Jerusalem under Ezra and Nehemiah in about 445 BC. Zechariah is laboring and preaching about 75 years later. The efforts of the ragtag band of returned Jews have not been easy and have not always met with success. In many ways, they remain prisoners of the Persians, but not, Zechariah says, in any final sense. They are rather prisoners of hope. St. Paul, who walked 10,000 miles in his lifetime in service to the gospel, certainly experienced many times of struggle. And we hear him struggling in our reading from Romans today with himself. It is painful to read while preaching liberty from the law and freedom in the spirit. In today's lesson, he seems a backsliding and tortured soul. He remains a prisoner, but increasingly, as we read through Romans, he becomes a prisoner of hope. Paul was worried and anxious because the past was tugging at the church in Rome and the churches he had worked so hard to plant in Asia Minor. 
Some church members insisted Christians had to observe rules of Jewish practice that had once dictated most aspects of people's lives. Paul taught that faith in the risen Christ freed them from obligations to religious authorities and to law, but not obligations to one another. And so over and over again, he stressed love and humility and forgiveness. Those were the things that worked. It's hard to read Paul and the gospel and conclude that individual salvation is the purpose of a life of faith. Instead, each precious salvation story is a brick in the undivided house of the beloved community. But sometimes, Paul had difficulty applying his own teaching to himself, and he was aware of this struggle. I recall an ambitious parishioner who had taken a quite demanding job and on Sundays she would arrive to church with dark circles under her eyes and she seemed to be carrying the weight of the world. I can't even pray, she said, lying in bed at 3 a.m. And I said something glib like, your tossing and turning may be a form of prayer, God never sleeps, to which her rejoinder was, well, neither do I. <laughs> St. Paul may have been in an insomniac phase, busily trying to order every dimension of his own life, every dimension of the lives of the churches he planted. He does not seem good enough to himself. He does wrong things, and he blames forces beyond himself. But the Spirit kept working with Paul, and later in the book of Romans, he acknowledges that only God is God and that perhaps it is all right if he messes up now and again and learns to go to sleep in confidence at night. I lived on a 400 acre farm one summer as a teenager called Grace Haven Farms. It was an experiment in Christian communalism which was the kinds of things that we did in the 70s. I was a suburban kid, as were all of my bunkmates, and I was learning how to tend chickens and pasteurize milk and bale hay and tend the gardens. Many things amazed us, that people worked that hard, that we could work that hard, and that food did not appear washed in plastic wraps on grocery store shelves. Carrots especially amazed me. I knew them only as orange and flawless things offered up a dozen at a time in clear bags at Kroger's. But the ones I pulled from the ground were dirty and multi-pronged and looked as though they were best fit for use in a voodoo ceremony. <laughs> Reprepared communal meals, broccoli, I discovered, always had tiny worms and bugs hidden in the flowers and required soaking in salt water so as to remove the worms, not always with entire success. <laughs> but how good that produce tasted, may, which may have had something to do with being 15 and having baled hay all day, but those were memorable meals. The post-conversion Paul seems initially uncomfortable with the spiritual version of carrots right out of the ground and wormy broccoli. In every iteration of life, Judaism, Christianity, rigid secularism, there is a human tendency to scrupulosity and perfectionism. And many of us suffer from early Paulism. What does your early Paulism and perfectionism look like? Often I meet one obligation only to reproach myself for another obligation I feel I have inadequately completed. I make pastoral calls but haven't given enough time to administration. I immerse in sermon preparation but to the detriment of entertaining. I socialize but can't keep up. I administrate but can never cross all the T's. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. You probably suffer from your own version 
of perfectionism, never quite getting it all doneism. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. Take my yoke, learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. What in the world might that mean for us? A yoke is the restraint which is placed on the neck of an ox or some other beast of burden so that it can do its work. The yoke must fit the animal well so that when the animal pulls, the yoke will give the creature little or no discomfort. It may be hard for us to identify in the 21st century with Matthew's metaphor. But by acknowledging that a yoke makes the heaviest burdens possible to bear, we can approach perhaps what Jesus was offering. As Paul Tillich put it, the burden Christ wants to take from us is the burden of repressive religion and of the law imposed by the people of his time who were religious authorities and who weighted down people with the burdens of the law. Those who labor and are weary laden are those sighing under the yoke of religious law. The yoke Christ offers is a new way of being, a free and personal relationship with the living God. It is being yoked to Christ and the work of Christ that we can discover perfect freedom. We live in relatively easy times, but is our ease genuine spiritual liberty? Christ's yoke is easy, but it is still a yoke. Christ's burden is light, but it is still a burden. It's a great conceit to imagine that the purpose of freedom is the avoidance of yokes and burdens. Genuine freedom involves accountability and responsibility and duty. We are to bear Christ's yoke and take up the burden. It will be easy because we work in the liberty of the Spirit, yoked to Christ and yoked to one another. It is light because the work is grounded in a principled relationship to God. But spiritual freedom, all freedom, is still labor and always entails sacrifice. After college and through my first master's degree, I worked in a small hospital as a respiratory therapy therapist. Generally, I was on the night shift. It was never a boring job. There were ventilators to manage, arterial blood sticks to draw, and there were patients in crisis. And when a code blue was called in the ER, everyone, anywhere in the hospital, it was my job to drop whatever I was doing and to run, not walk, to join the resuscitation team. When the call came, you went, racing down hallways, taking stairwells in three bounds. I liked the, adre the adrenaline, but what I liked most was the absolute clarity of focus. Someone's life was on the line, and you had a specific role to play in stabilizing a patient. We need, perhaps, a little more focus. Too much demands our attention. A little meekness of heart, a little more creatureliness, a little more certainty of our mortal nature leads us toward the clarity of focus, Christ's yoke, my brain. Our hearts are restless until united with God's good work in this world, work in service to the least likely as we align with Christ, in service to our neighbor, to the created order, to those in need, to the marginalized, and to the forgotten. We yoke ourselves to the disciplines reflected in Jesus, and that is to find right focus. Our materialist or our religious perfectionism are not of much use. We will find rest for our souls by uniting to God's song line. Life is not a project or a series of boxes to be checked. 
It isn't an accomplishment. Life is a wonder and a mystery to be lived yoked with God. Lifting the burdens of others in the manner of Christ as we yoke ourselves to one another with that focus, it makes for light work. But light work with joyful hearts. And it makes us prisoners of hope. Amen.